And uh, you know, for our next speakers, you know, if any of you happen to shop at Target between November and December of last year, you probably know why these guys are employed. <laughs> Uh, so we have Chris Weber and Jason Glassberg here. Uh, Jason Glassberg is the head of business development. He's managed diverse projects uh, for Fortune 50 companies, and Chris Weber is the managing principal. And he is an uh, industry leader. He's spoken at numerous conferences. He's written two books: Privacy Defended and Windows XP Professional Services. Service. And we also have uh, Tim Cranley here from the you know, Michelangelo team, who will be uh, doing some of the hosting. And, this is kind of going to be more of a panel discussion for this session. So please join me in welcoming them. Good morning, everybody. I hope you guys enjoyed your top five. Uh, so the, the format for this is really going to be kind of open discussion. We're going to talk about Target for a little bit. We're going to talk about some other things and then open it up for questions. At any point, if anybody has any questions, please you know raise your hand. Let me know. I'm happy to, to get this. This is really meant as more of an interactive session so that you guys can uh, uh, kind of pick these guys' brains because they are some of the experts in our industry when it comes to internet security. So, uh, with further ado, this is Jason and Chris. Welcome, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Uh, did you turn your mic on? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, in today's environment, uh, with attacks coming from everywhere, why did you guys choose to s open, found a, a security company? I guess I can go first. I, you know, I've always had a passion for building stuff and, and, and breaking stuff. You know, you build your Lego models and you destroy your Lego models. And really, security at the end of the day is just figuring out ways of taking apart um, something that someone else put together. And really, it's 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 kind of an interesting puzzle, right? Because people are always building stuff to make it work. You really test your your systems and you test your applications and you're always testing them for the desired results you want them to be successful. And it's kind of interesting to take it from a, a kind of a 30 degree angle approach and say, hey, what happens if you do it this way? You know, what happens if you, if you throw in and, and try and break this thing? What, what are some of the unintended results? And sometimes you get some pretty interesting answers. So generally it's just, it's, it, it, it's a fun way of looking at systems and it's a fun way of uh, breaking systems. And for me, uh, it's easier to break stuff than it is to build it, so I'm going to take the path of least resistance. Uh, so, um, actually, uh, in the 90s, I was a network administrator, and I was managing the network, and I was also helping uh, sheriff and police agencies build up some of their networks, and I was starting to see how, how open and vulnerable some of these systems were, and I started getting more and more interested in security, just by recognizing the fact that it was easy to access Police agencies through the public library, for example, um, and seeing people continually install domain admin accounts with blank passwords uh, because back then you could get away with it. Uh, so for me, I just kind of had a desire to move into security, learn more about how this stuff works. And at first, it was really overwhelming because security, you would think, is a niche in our technical industry, but it's a niche that just morphs into a, a hundred thousand different things. You have to know so much about. Uh, the, 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 the stack of technology from the lowest layers up to the highest layers and all the different technologies that go with it. But one of, you know, one of the interesting things though is we come across people always like, oh, security hackers, all this stuff. You know? But at the end of the day, really all we are are specialized QA guys. Right? We just look at our jobs as, just as any other test engineer would. Um, and it's just a, a very specialized, very narrowly focused area of, of QA. So. There's really no great magic or special tricks or, or, or uh, underhanded maneuvers. It's just you know solid testing and, and a solid testing methodology. There's a lot of room for creativity, though. Oh, absolutely, sure. absolutely. It's always more than like a skinny kid. So speaking of creativity, I think that's a great segue into the, the whole Target debacle that happened last year. You know, as everybody knows, I was one of the people affected by the Target. What happened there? Yeah, it's an interesting story. The anatomy of a, of a, of a hack target, you know, it's going to go down as one of the largest uh, credit card thefts in history to date. It's certainly one that's larger. And what's interesting is at the end of the day, you know, the, the headlines come out, wow, this is such a fantastic attack, a big, sophisticated attack. It, 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 it turns out it really wasn't. You know, it was just more of the same, more of the stuff we always see. It's a lot of unintended consequence 
a lot of small little errors that when added together cumulatively expose them to this breach. It, it turns out that there was uh, about two months previous to the big target pack, there was a random, typical email Trojan bomb sent out by some European, Eastern European group. Uh, happens every day, happens all the time. Um, one of the victims of this, you know, click on this email, open up this link, whatever, get a Trojan installed in your, in your, on your computer, was an HVAC heating ventilation company out in Pittsburgh or somewhere in Pennsylvania, Fabio, Fazio, and um, they uh, fell victim. Their, their systems were exposed, the back door was installed. And as these, as these attacks worked, the, the perpetrators were notified, they got a success, they went in, they investigated, they rooted around, um, and I guess they found some interesting information that led them to understand that these guys were a contractor for Target. Um, going on to the Target website, they noticed that Target was exceptionally generous in the amount of information they shared freely <coughs> with uh, their vendors. You would go onto a website, there was some documentation on how you would process a payment, how you would sign up for an account, all sorts of stuff, you know, how you sign up for their vendor management system and stuff like that. Uh, it turns out that they were, the attackers were able to get credentials for the payment processing system. And with these credentials, they were able to log on to the payment processing system and download further documents. Now, one of the interesting things about the documents they were downloading, they were downloading Word documents, Excel spreadsheets, blah, 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 blah. I don't know if any of you folks have ever gone into the Get Info or More Info. They store a lot of metadata in these documents. And some of the metadata they were able to uh, discover was, who was the last person who printed this document? A username. They were able to figure out what print server the document was printed to they were able to see what domain that print server was on. Interesting, just interesting information, in and of itself not that useful, but just interesting stuff. This is where things get murky. It appears they were somehow able to compromise the web server of this payment processing system, which allowed them to get into the target network. Well, of course, once into the target network, they already had a user. I mean, I'm sure they had more than one user downloaded as many documents as they could. They already were getting a feel for the layout of the topology of the network. They had domains, they started collecting um, computer uh, information and, and, and target file servers. And from there, they were able to find various things that would be in any network, maybe an unpatched server, an unpatched file server, that would allow them to get control. And, and what would happen is you would get in a beachhead, you'd get on one machine, you dump all the passwords, you dump all the users, and from that you go from one to another, to another, to another. It turns out Target was using a management software that allowed them to monitor servers and log in from uh, BMC. This particular management software installed what we call a service account, which is an account that runs locally with a high privilege that allows it to, to process it. And they had installed this without ever changing the default password, um, and it was running on all their servers. So once they were able to get onto one server, they were able to download all the passwords, dump the, the password hashes, crack them. They have a user account, they have a password, they have administrative privileges to the domain. From there, once you, know, once, once you become a domain admin, you, you pretty much own it. It turns out that they were able to get a rather primitive but effective what's called a memory scraping software that they, they the, these point of sale machines, which is a Windows, basically Windows boxes, they were able to install this memory resident program that was able to scrape um, the credit card numbers before they were encrypted and sent, and they were storing them locally and just pumping them out. And the volume with which they were able to do this is what's really impressive about the attack. I mean, we're talking about 40 some odd million credit cards in, in a matter of weeks. The previous record, I think, was Heartland Systems down in Florida, and that was a couple of million accounts, but that took months. So what's interesting is just how many 
of these cards. They were able to remove out of their system uh, before they were caught. Um, and that, that, that's really the, 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 the story. I mean, it's no different than any number of attacks that we've done since the mid-90s. I mean, you gain a beachhead, you somehow are able to break into the perimeter of the network, you break through, you get in, you establish a beachhead, and from there you go from one machine to another machine to another machine until you can, um, until you can gain control. And once you gain control, you root around and see what data is available. It just so happens that these guys had uh, quite a number of credit cards and um, a number of, of, again, issues that in and of themselves are significant, but not devastating, but when cumulatively added together, um, just really caused a, a significant problem. That's right. That's really it. That's right. I mean, it's a pattern that we've seen repeated throughout, as long as I've worked in this industry, just like Jason described it, the same methods that were used to break into Target, we've used over and over again to break into other people's systems and networks. Um, it starts with that one piece of information, and that's why we often tell people, you know, hey, we, we found in the comments on your website, we found an internal IP address and a username who checked in this code, you should scrub that out. At first, it seemed like pretty okay data to have out there, it doesn't like be harmful at all, but as you can see, one step leads to another. Information is everything. You know, there's no such thing as innocuous information in this business. So, so would you qualify the uh, e hackers that are trying to get through a lot of people work like this as data heroes? Because it's some of the same criteria that we heard in this morning. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I guess one man's freedom fighter is another man's <laughs> terrorist. You know? So I, 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 guess it, I guess it really depends. I would say that their methods are somewhat more unorthodox. Um, but you know, really, it's hard to say because you never want to credit. I mean, this was this is causing a lot of headache. I mean, aside from the financial cost, everybody, it's a lot of headache. Look, my wife shops there. We had to get all of our credit cards. I mean, it's just a real pain in the in the bottom. So you know, there are other ways of, of making your case. However, that being said, I think target the, the whole target incident is probably going to go down in significant as a more significant attack than some of the others that came across it. One, because A, the magnitude, um, and B, because it really has exposed significant flaws in a number of areas. Um, obviously, the whole concept of Target being able to protect their data took, took a significant hit. But also what's interesting is, is just how antiquated our whole credit card processing system is. I mean, when you think about it, do you know the only thing you need to get your credit card authorized is a number and a signature. That's it. They, they, they don't even check your signature. I mean, when was the last time you signed for a credit card and someone checked your signature against something? As long as you have that number and a signature, that credit card payment is going to get processed. Now, the reason there are, in Europe, there's a movement uh, to use what's called uh, pin and chip. Yeah. Well, here's the reason. It's it. You know why? Plain old dollars and cents. It costs more money to implement that system than they figure they're going to lose in fraud. It, well, it is, it's absolutely ridiculous. And so there, there lies the rub, right? So you've got these actuaries sitting there figuring out just how much money is it going to cost to implement the system versus, well, how much of a loss can we take before it's... Uh, it's, you know, it's like trying to figure out if, if buying a hybrid car is worth it. How many miles do I drive? Uh, and does, is it worth the extra cost? Now, nobody considers the, 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 the ridiculous pain in the butt it is once your once your information and, and what that can lead to, right? So they're not considering the fact that once someone's got my credit card, maybe they can use that to establish or help to establish a false identity, which leads to a whole identity. I mean, that's if you've ever been the victim of that, that is just... You, know, you, you, you don't even want to have to go there. It's a terrible, life-altering event. And so, you know, that, that's, that's one of the things I think the target, um, the target incident is going to expose. The other thing that's interesting is just how much of a significant financial loss Target took this quarter um, related solely to this breach. And I think a lot of folks in corporate America have to kind of step up and say, look, there's a reputational issue but there's also a significant financial cost involved. And so I would hope uh, that you know, there will be significant changes. The other, one last you know, point on this, kind of, you know, the other interesting thing is there is a, a consortium 
uh, of the credit card industry called PCI. P yeah, well, exactly. And so PCI exists to establish a baseline security standard of what you need to meet in order for to, to be acceptable to process these credit cards. It, it's almost laughably low bar. It, it's not only a laughably low bar, but it's also so widely open to interpretation that it's, it's, it's nearly impossible not to somehow pass your PCI certification. And really, so what does this PCI certifi certification exist for if, if only as window dressing? You know, and I think that the ability of these guys to go steal these credit cards, sell the credit cards in the black market, and, and cause all of this turmoil is really exposed just how, how ridiculously low the PCI bar is, and so hopefully that will get raised. Absolutely. Can you repeat the question? Well, well again, it, it, it has... It's not cost to them, it's cost to anybody else. So, so the question was, was, could the credit card companies it's mandate? No, or PCI. Yeah. Well, PCI, PCI mandate. Oh, understand, PCI is the credit card. Yep. Yeah. Right, so PCI is Visa, it's MasterCard, it's EuroCard. It's a governing body, right? Right. I mean, aren't they somewhat independent or not at all? No, they're, 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 they, they, the PCI was set up by the credit card company to ensure that you have met a certain standard in order to accept their credit card. So it's not in any way a government or, it, it is an industry body owned and operated by, by the, I believe it's, it's Visa, MasterCard, EuroCard, so the three, the three big ones. And so, yeah, one would hope, but again, it's, it's a matter of, of them having to implement this, and the cost to implement it is, it's, it, I think it was estimated something, you know, five billion something dollars to, to get this thing. We have a question over there. Anyway. Well, I was just like, can you, can you describe a little bit about this? Can you, so the question is, can you describe what the pin and chip Oh, pin and chip, yeah, very, very, very simply, and in layman's terms, this crypto, you know, I'm not a cryptographer, but essentially you've got a smart chip in the card that, ev and, and there is a pin associated, like you have a pin associated with your bank card. So every time, you use this card, a random or semi-random code is generated that uses your PIN as, as the hash, as kind of the decoder. So the, the, the number that's registered is never the same, but it's validated by the fact that you knew your PIN. So there's no credit card number per se, because right now you've got a magnetic strip, like, you know, it's like a, 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 an 8-track cartridge from 1960. And all that does is hold your number, right? So when they do a swipe, you're reading this, this very legible, unencrypted credit card number. With the pin and chip, you've got the chip that generates a new number that's seeded with a, a hash from your pin, and so that is authenticated there and then and there on the machine. So it's, it's more of a two-factor authentication right. system than a the single credit card number factor. Well, so the first one would be the pin, and the second one would be the hash. Right. right. And in some places, you can't even use your card in here because. So I came across. Right. I knew about this already, though, but so I brought cash. But there's places where their machines just don't have a way to swipe the card. Exactly. Now it doesn't it eliminate fraud altogether, but again, you just you know raising the bar, and so that's there, there's a pretty strong push. Now the problem is is that you know how are they going to implement it? Right? Are they going to implement? Because Europe has had a great success rate uh, implementing this. I think they used a study in. in that showed that it was about a 50% decrease in credit card fraud from using it. But they use a very stringent version. There are a number of, of different versions. You don't necessarily have to have the, the card reader do the encryption. You can just enter a PIN, and so that lowers the bar, but it's less expensive. Um, but of course, then it would be incompatible with the European version. So there's a number of discussions about it. Oh, also, I mean, you have the CSV code that's required right now. Is that well, it, to to the sense that it's a it's a, a second, uh, you know, it's it's a form of, um, uh, but it's not necessarily required, right? Because if I'm going into, uh, they, you can use it. You don't have to use it. There are many places online where you don't have to enter in that code. Well, it's almost like it's an optional extra. Well, the, op the optional extra is usually you'll get a more favorable discount rate. Right. If you provide more and more identifiers. Right. Uh, I guess the other point is, you know, somebody asked about why are we requiring this, it's the payment part putting the burden on merchants. Right. PCI is all about transferring the burden of, of uh, 
compliance and, and fraud prevention to merchants at a pretty high cost. Exactly. And then this would be doing it even further. And also, and also kind of mm -hmm. with, at least with PCI version 3 that's just coming out, it's not a, well, I mean, it, it is just as ambiguous, but it's not a low bar at all. I mean, like, doing referral is, is right. going to be requiring just a web server to point to a server. <laughs> And it's a long process. I mean, I got a letter from Target last week saying that they're accelerating their pin and chip rollout of their cards, but that the accelerated rollout was going from 2017 to 2016. You know, it was a $120 million rollout that even their accelerated plan was still, you know, two years away. So it's, it's complex, yes? It should be going if you're um, on site with your uh, direct uh, It's difficult to know to put, um, Transaction, the actual online. So um, the chip will not. Right, and that that is that is so a lot of those companies they say, you know what? Um, the number of purchases that can go through online. Well, it's so interesting. It's a lot more than the right, one. and the and it's interesting you say that because the same study that I was referring to, the cut the, they, they showed that they, in fact the increase in fraud online had increased. So you know, again, I mean this. Service. Like, there's never a perfect answer. You know, we deal in security. There's no such thing as perfect security. Nothing's ever going to be perfectly secure, right? All you can ever hope to do is just keep raising the bar, uh, so it, it it winds up being less convenient or less easy. Yeah, because I'm from Canada. All our cards. I was surprised that you didn't have chip. I was yeah. not, I couldn't you know. But once I use my card here, you know. Yeah, it's open. It's, it's out. Look, I mean. There is no chip, yep. the recognition thing, and, 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 and nobody has been saved. Unless it is a global standard, it would make a lot of sense, but it's just And that, and that's what, that, that's what, that, 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 and that's the big discussion and argument. It's like, you know, people are worried that the United States is going to implement a system that is somehow of a lower quality, and, you know, the chain is always as strong as the weakest link, and once the credit card is out there and it's been authenticated and is good, it can be used. So, agreed completely. You know, got to be a global standard. We're a question over there and then a question in the back. Um, I'm just curious how, how Target got tipped off that something was happening and, um, and how they were able to correlate credit card numbers to emails. It seems like a lot of people, they, they were saying how emails people that were affected, that just like people that were Target members or they had Yeah, well I guess they, <laughs> did you ever get that business where they're like, would you like me to email your receipt? Yeah, and they ask that so that they're building large contact lists so and a lot of really people. Using credit card number and then email. Right. I'm not, you know, I'm not, I would imagine that at some point, they, I believe they were notified by some credit card issuers that there were a number of um, uh, credit cards being released. Now, they must have somehow gone back and, and seen some kind of large data sucking action because they were just, you know, data. Uh, coming out. I'm not aware of how the, the the scale was actually, you know, the tipped, how the alarm got, got set off. Um, and I'm also not that familiar with how Target does their, you know, co coordinating between uh, um, credit card numbers and users, although they may have had some kind of master user list because, you know, you get mailings and they, they sure they did some kind of name and address correlation. I'm not exactly sure how that, that works. Yeah, for sure. We had a question in the back. Yes, I'm just curious. Do they ever cash these credit card fees? Yes. The question is, do they ever cash the credit card fees? They do. Um, I believe it was last year they caught a large uh, group operating out of Vietnam. Okay. Um, yeah, and it was it was interesting because the big news there was uh, a it was um, you know inter Interpol, the FBI, and and you know kind of this global coordination, but also that we were able to get some some kind of cooperation at this scale from the Vietnamese government. Um, but yeah, that was that was a big uh, a big catch, and of course you know one of the most famous of these credit card thieves is a fellow named Alberto Gonzalez. I don't know if you guys are. Familiar. He was uh, he was the guy who was uh, uh, responsible for the previously largest credit card heist, which was Heartland Credit Card Processing Systems down in uh, in Florida, and he was he was caught. Um, I think they, they they are caught actually more frequently than not. Uh, 
Um, none of this is super sophisticated because basically they take these large spreadsheets, bundle them up, and sell them over the web. Uh, you know, payment systems like Bitcoin tend to complicate these issues, but uh, no, they are they are actually caught and they're prosecuted. I think Albert Gonzalez is in jail for, for 20 years. So some, somebody's paying the price. So Chris, from your perspective, I mean, it's, it's 2014. We've got at least two generations of internet people now. You know, people who have been uh, brought up and have kind of grown up with the internet. Why, why do companies still get hacked? I mean, why does this still happen? Well, it's really complicated stuff and it's continually changing. I mean, if you go back to 2000, uh, even before that, it seemed a little more simple. We just had networks and, and then we just started putting up websites. Uh, and now we've added to the mix all sorts of cloud services, all sorts of integration with partners and third parties. Uh, we've added mobile devices into the mix. It just continually changes the landscape. Um, so from an enterprise perspective, it's really about resources and where do we apply our resources to these problems of security. Um, so it, we, like I mentioned before, the, the stack, I mean, we, we got to start at the, at the perimeter, obviously. You know, our, our hard outer shell and then work our way in and really focus on what things we want to protect versus what things we're willing to give up. Um, so in a case like a credit card processing system that's, that's crunching and crunching and crunching millions and millions of dollars a day in transactions, that, that's obviously a high priority uh, asset that needs to be protected and we need, we need to really focus in on how we're going to secure that system. Yeah, so it's uh, it's it's complicated. It's really complicated. So. Chris is a big proponent of, of the assume breach mentality. Right? I think <coughs> one of the one of the problems that that we still see companies wrestling with is that they're under the impression that they can build this really thick, hard outer perimeter wall that no one will ever break into, and that you know we'll build our fortress, our, on all of our data will be safe like a medieval castle. And it, it just, it doesn't work that way, right? The thing is, no matter what you do, and no matter how high of a bar or a wall you build, somehow, somewhere, someone is gonna get it. And it may be because of some flaw in the router, it may be because of some programmatic flaw, it may be even because of some disgruntled employee, right? I mean, these are all significant risks and these are all significant issues. You know, people need to start working under the working principle of assume breach, right? I am going to assume that someone can break into my network. Once they've broken into my network, what can they do? What can they get to, right? And even a step further, it's assume they're already on my network. Right. So operate with the mentality that we already have attackers inside our systems. They're operating sort of very discreetly, um, very cautiously, and they're moving very slowly. So we need to monitor you need to know, back to what I was talking about before, you need to know where your assets are and focus your monitoring efforts on those. Right, because, you know, again, you know, they, and one of the reasons why we think these things still happen is because people tend to set up networks that are flat because it's easy to get from point A to point B if I don't have to go through all of these jump boxes. And, and again, you know, if you assume that someone's already breached my network, I don't want to make it easy for them to be able to get from point A to point B. You know, one of the things we recommend companies do is that they, 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 you need to classify an inventory of your data. Some data is extremely important, some data is medium important, and some data is really not that important at all. And so given that this is complicated stuff, and given that you only have so many resources, you need to really focus <coughs> your attention on the data that's really important. If I'm a target, I'm processing customer information, processing financial information, I want to make sure whatever piece of my network is responsible for that is as separate and distinct from the rest of my network as possible. If I'm going to be monitoring this, I want to make sure that the full focus of my monitoring is on these important parts of my network and not just random parts, right? There was another interesting attack that happened at the same time Target, Neiman, uh, Neiman Marcus, got hit also. Not nearly as, as large of an attack, um, and, and, and in fact, in many ways, a much more amateurish effort. But what's interesting about the Neiman Marcus attack is that uh, as the, one of the reports that came out said that, that the, 
the IDS system that Neiman Marcus had implemented was firing something on the order of 60,000 alerts a day that this malicious software was being installed on these, on these machines. And basically, they thought it was false positives, right? Oh, this happens all the time. I mean, this is you know, one of the problems with these IDS systems is that they really need to be fine-tuned um, because otherwise, you just get inundated with this data and you tend to miss the, 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 the important stuff, which is why you, know, you really want to take this, you want to focus your, your, your most critical assets, you want to make sure the monitoring is tuned, and you want to make sure you're actually watching that, that monitoring. And I think that that's part of the reason why we still see these kinds of attacks, is that people are, have this kind of older school, flat, not assumed breach mentality. There, there's a lot of focus these days on data analytics, insecurity, you know, and applying the stuff that Jason's talking about, I mean, we're getting 60,000 alerts from just from one system, and then we're also getting information about um, intelligence from the community, and we're also getting information about where our vulnerabilities are on a daily basis, and we're also getting information about how people are using our systems, and we're trying to correlate a lot of different things and a lot of different data points, to try to figure out how we can start to detect these things better, how we can start to detect attackers better. I mean, just to think of the complexity, just consider for a second uh, a product like Google Docs, you know, it's, it's providing a service to millions and millions of business customers, just like Microsoft Office 365, for example, or uh, Salesforce. And just think of the complexity of what, I mean, what the operating operation staff and the engineers are dealing with when they're seeing millions of customers using these systems on a daily basis in ways that weren't you know ever necessarily expected or intended and trying to kind of figure out who's doing who's poking around who's looking for that that hole that's going to get them deeper into the network who's who's looking to fish out another customer's data it's it's, it's a there's a lot of different vectors to it i mean we have a pretty good handle on on how attackers work because we behave like attackers quite often and a lot of the patterns are the same like we said so we're just applying that at different scales across different products, across different industries, uh, but it's still a very complex problem. So we have a couple of questions real quick. One over here first. Well, you know, we've been doing a lot of discussion about the issues and the complexities of some of the issues and then the simplicity of some of the things that are being used to attack. How much, of, how many more breaches do we have to have of that magnitude before CEOs and CISOs and people that are in these in the companies start getting an idea that, you know, from a cost standpoint, it is, you know, a, a bigger impact. It seems like we have to have something of that magnitude of target to get people to wake up and say, hey, simple things like application testing, you know, and making sure that you're running scans on your on your code, things like looking at segmentation of your internal networks, things like looking at all these different things we've been talking about for the last 20 years, really. To, uh, the IT industry about from a security perspective um, just seem to keep going over people's head. And I mean, Sam's just published top 20 50 safeguards, right? How many people are really implementing any of those things into their environments? And do we have any way of, me of measuring or seeing what the progress in these areas? Because it seems like um, the things you guys are talking about, the way that attack is perpetrated, again, goes back to the simple things that they've been done protect that network infrastructure and also those applications. Yeah, so the question real quick was, was what's the tipping point what's between tipping point? reputation and cost? Yep. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I don't really know if there's an answer, but you know, the, the other problem you've got is the, I, I'm not an actuary, <laughs> I don't play one on TV, but I think a lot of this has to do with companies' internal decisions because they're, when you think about the number of corporations that are out there that are actually running critical infrastructure on like Windows or, or XP, you know, I, I, because the cost of upgrading is quote unquote hot, you know, they, therein lies the rub. You know, you've got this out of pocket immediate expense versus some, I, I'm just playing devil's advocate, this theoretical, like, why would they come after us without understanding that these attacks are drive-by crimes of opportunity. No one necessarily is looking to target you, per se. You're going to get caught up in this sweep of Trojan emails or, or some scan for some you know, SQL injection attack, and your web server is going to be vulnerable or once they're in, they're in. Um, and, and I think therein, therein lies the rub. I don't know, you know the, what the language is to qualify and quantify this 
out-of-pocket expense to upgrade to a more modern, sophisticated, sensible versus some theoretic potential, you know? And I don't know if the, the formula has been created yet, but, but this is, this, therein lies the rub. But, but the second part of the question is really around the things that we're seeing that are perpetrating 90, about 97% of the intrusions and attacks that are occurring are on basic things, password well, changes. Right, and that, that, that really, you know, that's what I was going to say. So, you know, for all of the sophisticated stuff that we deal with, I mean, programmatic buffer overruns and all sorts of really complicated stuff, it's, it's the human parts of the equation that are always the most difficult ones to address because I can have the most secure system with two-factor, all this stuff, but if the help desk resets my password with this one-time reuse password, well, what are you going to do? Right. It's, it's training and it's, 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 it's having people understand and, and understanding that systems and system security will only get you so far. It's the human equation that is almost always and somehow responsible for these breaches. It's the person clicking on the email they really shouldn't have, right? Your virus detection may have caught it, may have not caught it, but at the end of the day, why are you clicking on an attachment from an email that, that you don't know about? Yeah. What do you see in the database areas of information security that are allowing us to do a better job of protecting that database layer? Specifically, so the question is, what are we doing to protect at the database layer? Yeah, both in the both in the transactionary uh, data flows as well as at the data yes. What do what you see as some of the best methods of being able to Well, it, it, I mean, it kind of depends on on the context, but. It, in, in terms of how we protect data in the database, and you can, I mean, envision it in sort of concentric circles, right? I mean, uh, it does come down a lot to auditing access, um, also applying access controls as, as precisely as you can across the data, also sandboxing data. Um, it depends on your, your environment, what you're doing. If you have multiple different sort of tenants sharing data within a database, um, how do you safeguard against them accessing each other's data? And you, you can do it you know, through proper programming techniques um, and through a proper application security techniques and also implementing the, the, some of the features that are available in the database system. So we, we've been seeing a lot of a, a much higher increase in the use of uh, encryption as well as IPsec, both from an encryption and an authentication perspective. Um, and that's really uh, probably your first line I would imagine um, we have guys who do much more of the deep, deep, deep database and database programming stuff. But you know, one of the one of the recommendations that are always coming out of uh, these kinds of reviews is you know, understanding your data, encrypting your data, and properly uh, authenticating. And SQL injection is still one of the top threats in the application layer, uh, and we've been educating people about this for a long time. And a lot of people get it. This comes back to the, the, the core of the problem that the, the attacker's got the easy job. They just need to find one hole, you know. I, I changed one firewall rule for just one night because I needed to deploy some system for testing and attackers found it, you know. And same thing in the database layer. I mean, if you change one thing and forget to change it back, they have it in. If you have a SQL injection vulnerability hanging out there in a web application or some mobile application, you have to figure out, well, what context is that command going to be running under in my application in, in the database? And, and quite often, a SQL injection attack leads to full control over the database. Yeah, a lot of these, a lot of these breaches that, that have happened, not because of a network or infrastructure, um, have happened because of SQL injection. SQL injection and not sanitizing um, is, 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 is just bad. And so there's really a need to have awareness. We have a question over there. Talking to the. Yeah. <laughs> um, in your experience, what about the true information? It sounds like the fact that there's not, not, not that much loss incurred in credit cards, for example, means that they're not really using your credit card with the data to actually buy stuff. There's, really a, there's a lot of different. The question is, what are hackers doing with this information? I mean, and there's a lot of different actors out there. I mean, there's there's a lot of espionage. There's a lot of government spying. There's a lot of uh, thieves stealing credit cards. There's script kitties out there just toying around. 
Um, and there's hacktivism. I mean, that's that's a big thing and, now. And hacktivism with you know groups like Anonymous and, and Lulzac who want to make a statement. I mean, it, it comes down to everybody's hacking everybody. And, and there's a, a, there's a lot of ways to monetize these kinds of attacks, right? Which I think is, is kind of what you're asking. Yeah. So, I can get your credit card number and use your credit card, and that's useful for some things. But another useful thing is to have your machine as part of my command and control army, right? Because interestingly, there are the groups out there who control mass numbers of these zombie machines who can flip them on at a switch and cause a denial of service attack. And this is actually a big business. You can go out there, there are websites, and say, I need to I need a thousand machines to do this kind of denial of service attack uh, against this target. Maybe it's a competitor, maybe I have a problem with it or something. And so people rent these <coughs> machines out. I also need a machine because as much as I don't understand anyone who would ever respond to a spam email for some product, there are people who obviously do because that business refuses to die. You need to be able to have any number of thousands of machines to constantly be able to regenerate and send these mails out because as soon as people realize it's coming from a spam address that address is blocked you need to move on so it's, it's, it's a constant number of you know machines and then quite frankly i need to attack target i don't want to attack target from my own machine sitting in my house i don't even want to connect to a machine that i'm going to attack target to i want to have a line of machines so complicated and diverse that it would be impossible to, to track. So there's a lot of ways, and, and, and in each step of this, there's someone controlling this machine and charging someone else for the use of it. So um, there's, there's, there's a lot of money involved. That, that's one of the ways they do it. We have another question here. We'll be talking about data, and the um, majority of business is collect data and analyze based on that data. And sometimes we confront with a choice whether we post that data locally or with the cloud. And more and more services, uh, out of service in the cloud, like Amazon. Uh, how do you how do you strategize over local hosting or cloud hosting? So the question is, how do you strategize over local hosting versus cloud hosting? Well, I mean, I think in more general sense, it comes down to like cost benefit analysis. Right. I mean, in terms of security, then it's it's a matter of compliance requirements. What are my business requirements first around this data and understanding those. Yeah before you even try to dive into the technical requirements. Um, I would naturally assume that anything out in the cloud is probably not going to be as secure as something you can build yourself if you have the wherewithal to support that. That's, that there, you know, that, and again, it boils down to data classification, just how secure uh, and what kind of data are you going to be collecting, and just how much resources can you put into protecting that, that data, right? Um, and those are kinds of questions you need to ask. Do you have a support staff that can support a data? And, and how often does that data need to be accessed, right? Is this stuff that needs to be 24 by 7, regardless? Um, can it be down? Yeah, who are the consumers of the data, right? If you start feeding this to third parties or other applications. Right. right. Can I, is it generally open to the public? Or is this a business to business relationship where I can create very specific rules that allow only access to, to one person? So all of this kind of needs to feed into the into the equation. I don't just like there's no there, there's no one answer depending on what on what it is you need to do. So not concerned about NSA. Well, you know, they, what are you going to do? Right? I mean, they're out there. They're not going away. You know, I, I mean, if you're going to start worrying about that, uh, we're we're all on the wrong. <laughs> I mean, again, just just you know, assume breach and, and encrypt. Um, the problem is, what do you encrypt? <laughs> they, seem to, they, yeah. seem to, they seem to have the keys to all that stuff. <laughs> you know, that, that, there, therein lies the rub. I don't know if, if, if what, what any one entity or person can do when a government starts getting involved. They invariably can call more resources uh, to the task than any one individual can. Well, and this is where we've been focusing a lot of attention in the sort of the standards community has been focused on, all right, how do we really address the threat of government surveillance, not just the NSA, but globally? because it's going on, it's perpetual across the world. Um, we've, seen, we've seen espionage campaigns that have been ongoing for years and years before they even get discovered, and implanting themselves across multiple businesses, government agencies, and just sort of siphoning information. 
Um, and then we're starting to see all these weaknesses in our core protocols like TLS and SSL. And yeah, we're that's really starting to chase these down and look at the root cause and find some interesting, <laughs> interesting flaws that are very questionable. So um, a lot of it does come down to which protocol you choose. Now we know we have a better understanding of what this might be, like Jason said, which, which encryption methods you use. So where does somebody start? If they needed to, if they wanted to come and, and get to a point where they were more secure, where, where do you start? It's a very complex problem. Yeah, well, where do you start? I, I, I mean, my, we're asked this quite a bit. You know, people are you know, overwhelmed with this wall of, of ah. But really, you know, you, you, you just need to start with your low hanging. Right. Understanding that for all of these high-tech attacks we talk about, really at the end of the day, what's given up the goods? The goods are being given up because somehow, somehow, somehow someone got a credential. How did they get that credential? They got it through some phishing. They got it through some social engineering. They got it through some way that caused someone to give up the goods. Start with what you can control, right? I mean, don't think outside of your area of control. I mean, don't put your passwords and credentials in your source code files or your configuration files or your store procedures, first of all. Think about how you're handling your own information. And then patch your stuff. It's not too difficult just to keep your servers and your operating systems up to date. Patch your browsers, right? Make sure you're running the latest version of the browser. Run an antivirus. Make sure that antivirus is A, up to date, and also up to the task. Um, and, you know, start <coughs> thinking about ways of, of classifying your most important crown jewels of your, of your business or your network. You know, what is it that's most important? What is it that I'm protecting here that I can't give up regardless? And focus energies towards that and start building the plan. You know, we talk in terms of um, threat modeling and attack surface analysis, right? What, what are the areas that someone could attack me? How are ways that they could possibly get in through these attacks? And where would those attacks lead them? You can draw a nice diagram, you know, here's my networks and here's ways you can attack. And going through these kinds of exercise can be extremely beneficial because A, it kind of gives you an awareness of where your weaknesses may be and where your mitigations are or you think your mitigations and you can always test against those, right? I'm running an antivirus, or I have this authentication mechanism here, but does it really work? Is there any way to bypass it? So you can, you can test it. And then it also allows you to classify your, your, your assets and decide which are the ones that you think are the most important to protect. And that's really where you need to kind of focus, focus your energy. So, you know, it, obviously it's complicated. There's a lot of work to be done. But really, there's a lot of stuff you can do to kind of raise the bar up to a level. The more you can raise the bar, the harder it is for someone to attack. So we've got a couple last minutes before we're going to break for lunch. I know everyone's very focused on lunch at this point, but are there any other questions? So just a comment and a question with this, but I think it was important, the point you brought up about it's, it's people forget that a lot. You know, they think that we're okay. The personnel that work for our company are okay. We you know Joe Joe, you know, he's a great guy. You know, and I think they have to, uh, as you're employing a lot of the things you guys have talked about, it's important to realize you're also protecting inside as well as putting outside. Yeah, exactly. I saw you laughing when I, when I mentioned don't put your credentials into your source code file, for example. Like that. And that's the number one way we break into networks when we get hired to do a penetration test. We get inside the internal network and on the wikis, on the internet pages, on the file shares, or in the source code and listments, we'll find credentials. You know, either out there just in documents to share with the team, or because the developer needed to include a database connection string somewhere. And that's, that's usually all it takes for us. So the question that goes on that now is, since we've talked about external security and internal security, and what to do in some ways to mitigate the problem, how do you get that word across to cloud vendors who are now the ones in charge of my data? So the question is how to get the word to the cloud vendors who are handling your data about security. They're probably getting an inkling. <laughs> Most of the major cloud providers these days, you know, they are they are taking the right step. Um, so in terms of like off like office business style applications. We work with them. We, we 
certainly are getting hired by them. So they're showing at least that much uh, foresight. We have foresight. I think we have one last question over there. Oh, uh, yeah. You were mentioning about that SSL also has its holes. Yes. Um, so I guess in terms of data transfer, what protocol would you recommend that to use well, for data transfer? For data transfer, for the data transport layer, we recommend TLS 1.2 latest version of TLS be configured um, and be configured with the strongest set of ciphers available. All, almost, well, all modern web browsers support TLS 1.2. Okay, is it based on SSL? It uh, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's sort of one of the same. So, it's, uh, but SSL 3.0 and 2.0, are we're, we're leaving those behind and we're, we're all focusing on TLS. Well, Jason and Chris, I want to thank you very much for uh, oh, thank you. sitting and talking with us today. Quick reminder, lunch is on the Grand Ballroom upstairs, so if you just take the escalators upstairs, you guys uh, will be able to eat there today. Okay, thank you.